I was going to ask you to explain quantum computing, but <laughs> um, when do you expect uh, Canada's ISIL mission to begin again? And are we not doing anything in the interim uh, while we prepare? Okay. Uh, very simply, normal computers work uh, by... Uh, <laughs> Welcome to Moonshot, the show exploring the world's biggest ideas and the people making them happen. I'm Christopher Lawson. And I'm Andrew Moon. And you're listening to a press conference from 2016 where Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was jokingly questioned about the quantum leap that is taking place in the computing world. And it turned out that he wasn't quite ready to let that joke slide. Don't interrupt me. When you walk out of here, you will know more. Well, no, some of you will know far less about quantum computing, but most of you, normal computers work uh, either there's power going through a wire or not. It's one or a zero. They're binary systems. Uh, what quantum states allow for is much more complex information to be encoded into a single bit. Regular computer bit is either a one or a zero, on or off. A quantum state can be much more complex than that because, as we know, uh, things can be both particle and wave at the same times, and the uncertainty around quantum uh, states uh, allows us to encode more information into a much uh, smaller computer. So uh, that's what's exciting about quantum computing, and that's what we're going to do. Um, don't, don't get me going on this or we'll be here all day, trust me. As the Canadian PM so eloquently explained there, quantum computing takes advantage of the ability of subatomic particles to exist in more than one state at any time. And if these systems really do become a day-to-day -day reality, they'd be able to solve problems that our normal personal computers just can't. As Eric Ladinsky, co-founder of quantum computing startup D-Wave, explained back at WIDE in 2014. Imagine uh, you had a, a math problem. Well, I'll make it easier. Let's say you go to the Library of Congress. There's 50 million books. In one of them, I secretly put an X on one of the pages. I tell you to go into that library. I want you to find the X. You have five minutes. You say, well, okay, it's going to take me many lifetimes to go through those books sequentially. I'm not even going to take that problem. But if, if somehow I could put you in this magical quantum superposition in which you were in 50 million parallel realities, and in each one you try a different book. Now the other important feature is that you have to be able to collaborate with all your other selves. And these aren't clones of yourself, the same physical matter is somehow playing out all these different roles. Talking to your other selves we call coherent evolution. You're kind of cohere, coherent to your other selves and you can share information. Well now you find the book very quickly and that's quantum computing in a nutshell. Stop and think about that for just one second. From weather forecasting to artificial intelligence, chemical engineering and drug design, quantum computers have the potential to completely change the way that we think about solving complex problems. But how far away are we from really seeing quantum computers used to tackle the world's biggest, meatiest problems? We'll have more on this great big topic right after this break. The basis of today's computing is we think that uh, any problem is sort of solvable with a supercomputer as long as we have enough memory or we have enough CPU or we have enough time to solve that problem. But there are actually certain problems that these classical computers will never be able to solve. This is Anna Fan, a researcher for IBM based in Melbourne. IBM has been doing an awful lot of research in the quantum computing space. This topic is very much a buzzword in technology circles at the moment, but what exactly is it? To understand, we actually need to know how our existing computers, including the phone in your pocket, work right now. You heard this earlier from Justin Trudeau's impromptu explanation, but most computers store information in binary units, called bits, which can take a value of 0 or 1. It's kind of like having many on and off switches that control a device. Now, this system works really great for traditional computing. However, a quantum computer uses qubits, which are created using atoms or photons, and can then store that information in many different states. As you scale up the number of qubits, the power of your quantum computer scales also, allowing you to solve more complex problems and algorithms. 
And that's a really important point to understand. Quantum computing isn't about making the next iPhone 100 times faster. Quantum computers are really about solving for big, complicated problems. Multiple qubits is where the power comes from. This is Alberto Peruzzo. He's head of the Quantum Photonics Lab at RMIT University in Melbourne. When you have uh, um, to identify a, a, a qubit, uh, you need uh, two parameters. To identify four, two qubits, you need uh, four parameters. And then every time you, you add uh, a, um, a qubit to your uh, you know, string uh, of information, you basically encode, uh, you double the encoded information in that. Uh, and that's where the power comes from. So if you have three bits, uh, you need three parameters. But if you have three qubits, you need eight parameters. And it's this ability to rapidly increase the number of parameters available in the system that allows quantum computing to solve for some of nature's greatest and most complex problems. There are problems uh, in, in chemistry and physics that uh, even if you had uh, a computer of the, size, uh, of the size of the whole planet, uh, you would never be able to solve. So it's just at some point... Uh, you can make a problem that is big enough uh, that rules out any, mm, any cap capacity that we could ever think about performing with these classical methods. An example of such is simulating, simulating molecules down to their most fundamental interactions. So consider sort of uh, caffeine in your cup of coffee. Um, this is surprisingly this is complex enough that it takes sort of 10 to the 48 um, classical bits to try to simulate and understand that. So that's 10 to the 48 is sort of almost uh, all of the atoms on Earth at the moment. But on a quantum computer, this would only take about 100, uh, 160 to 200 qubits to understand. And if after all of that, you're still confused about the idea of a qubit, you wouldn't be alone. We've been looking at this topic for a while now, and it's still pretty confusing. So here's Will Zeng, Director of Evangelism and Special Projects at quantum computing startup Regetti, to explain. You should think about it as sort of the amount of memory you have in your quantum computer. Uh, and, and, and by that, I mean, it's actually not the only thing you'd use to measure the performance of a quantum computer. Like when you look at a laptop, you're not just looking at your hard disk, you're looking at your RAM, you're looking at your clock speed, you're looking at a whole bunch of different parameters. And when you look at a quantum computer, it's the same sort of thing. Um, you want to look at the number of qubits, the quality of those qubits, um, the way they're connected matters as well. And then other features like their clock speed and the latency with which you can access that quantum computing system. And when we think about a quantum computer, we try and take into account all of those different features because we, as we've discovered more and more of those different um, parameters by working with users who, who work with our systems, we've realized how much they matter as well as the number of qubits. So from Will's explanation, the parallels become a little clearer between qubits and regular computer memory. More qubits, faster computer. But it's not the only factor. Now, these qubits can come in many different varieties and forms based on the technology and the types of molecules that a company might use in development. As Will just mentioned, the number of qubits might be important, but what's also valuable is the quality of those qubits, how those qubits are connected and what they're made from. As an example, you could use uh, trapped ions, you could use uh, atoms, you could use uh, superconductors, you can use... Uh particles of light, which are called photons. And depending on which technology, which, which particle you, you're going to use, uh, you might uh, face different technological issues. So this uh, basically branches uh, out into different uh, research fields. They all want to build a quantum computer, but they have different approaches. It's a bit like using different materials to, to build a chair or a table. And then there is a, a little bit of competition between these dif different particles. My group uh, is specialized on using photonics. Uh, so we, use, uh, we encode quantum information in states uh, of single photons, which are single particles of light. 
Now, Alberto says while there are significant challenges with using photons in quantum computing, the big advantage will be when it comes to networking these systems, because using photons you'll be able to connect multiple quantum computers and send information easily between them. Photons are flying qubits, so a photon light moves very fast and if you put in the right material, will maintain its properties. So you can send the quantum information across an optical fiber or through air very, very far with minimal noise. If you try and do the same uh, on other particle, with other particles, it would be impossible. Unlike Alberto's team at RMIT, over at IBM, they're using superconducting qubits, which is what many companies, including Rigetti, are also using. And they've been able to make significant advancements in this technology. And in that space, we've been able to create more and more qubits over the years and connect them and try to uh, run more algorithms and more complicated algorithms on them. Because quantum computers are great at solving for complexity, they're perfect for a research environment. And everyone we spoke with for this episode says the future involves having both quantum computers and regular computers sitting side by side because they both have their own strengths. We cannot really tell if, you know, in the next few years we will find more applications of quantum computers. But as of now, we don't expect it to be able to run you know, Microsoft Word uh, on a quantum computer. But if you're going to, de- you know, detect a disease or uh, predict, uh, you know, the behavior of a, of a drug, that could be, um, they, they, they will definitely have an advantage. You might not be surprised to know that there actually aren't that many quantum computing systems around. And that's for a number of reasons. Not only is the process of creating qubits incredibly complex, to actually operate one of these systems at an optimal level You need to keep it in an environment as close as possible to absolute zero. We build these systems and we put them into something called a dilution refrigerator. And these actually work at uh, sort of 15 to 20 millikelvin. So that's, you know, 15 to 20 millikelvin above absolute zero. That's actually colder than outer space. And so that is needed so we can actually control these systems uh, to the extent that we need to do these computations. And for those of you playing at home who may not remember temperature conversions from science class, my hand is going up, absolute zero is equivalent to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius or minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty darn cold. And to keep the system running at that temperature requires an awful lot of gear. There is a, a, a lot of infrastructure around the, the, the refrigerator where the chips are laid, as well as the room temperature electronics needed to control the systems and then connect to the internet so that other people can use them. And this is where we keep the quantum computer. So this is a cryostat. It can reach uh, uh, one uh, Kelvin of temperature. Um, that's, that's pretty cold. It's pretty cold. It's not as cold as uh, uh, superconducting qubit technology um, requires, but for uh, photonics, uh, um, it's enough. So what we need it for is to cool down the single photon sources and the single photon detectors that uh, uh, operate need to operate at very low temperature for uh, noise issues. Uh, um, and because our detectors are based on superconductors, the superconductor needs to be cooled below their critical temperature. And uh, when a photon gets absorbed by the superconductor, it brings the superconductor into a conductor, and you can use this to monitor the presence of the detection of single photons. It looks like something that you might see in like a, almost like a sci-fi sort of film or something like that. Yeah, so this, um, this cryostat uh, contains a number of shields that... Uh, uh, basically separate uh, stages of cooling and also protect from uh, external radiation, the devices. And uh, it also contains uh, a large number of uh, electrical and optical connections that we can then use to access the chip uh, at the bottom of the cryostat. Now, Alberto says that the size of the machinery needed to house the quantum computing chip can be tens of square metres in size, all for a chip that measures just a few centimetres. 
So in the end, you're probably not going to have a quantum computer sitting on your desk at any point in the near future. But that won't really matter, because IBM and Rogetti are both working on building ecosystems for researchers and developers to use these quantum computers remotely. And we'll take a look at these systems right after the break. Welcome back to Moonshot, I'm Christopher Lawson, and as I mentioned before the break, quantum computers are physically pretty large due to all the equipment needed to keep them in their optimal operating state, which is as cold as possible. Which means most people won't have direct access to one of these systems. But if you're a researcher out there wanting to solve a complex algorithm, IBM and Rigetti are both working on cloud-like systems to allow you to leverage their quantum resources. So two years ago, we put a couple of uh, put a couple of quantum computers on the cloud for people to use. Um, so we put a five qubit computer up there, and we were, uh, we allowed people to use them using a drag and drop interface. And then from there, we realized that drag and drop was obviously uh, too basic for some of the more sophisticated developers out there and then released a API and SDK where people could program these quantum computers using Python. People can run uh, chemistry and optimization and artificial intelligence applications without really understanding the uh, quantum computing, just like you, you use other computing packages today. We call ourselves a full stack quantum computing company. We make hardware and software for quantum computing that we provide through our quantum cloud services platform. That's Will Zeng again from Rigetti. Rigetti's goal is to build a 128 qubit system, which is much higher than the record set by Google with 72 qubits in early 2018, and is very similar to IBM. And because they're looking to find a sustainable business, they're allowing researchers to use their software on a cloud-based platform. So w- one of the things we realized quite quite early on is that uh, in order to make the best use of this technology, we need to grow a field of an ecosystem of, of developers and users who can who can apply it. And the best way to do that was with an open uh, an open platform where we actually put our prototypes um, out quite quite early in their development for people to start to use them to start to figure out the programming models. Rigetti have taken a very platform driven approach towards quantum computing. They released a Python API for quantum programming with open source Python libraries. We've uh, already had users working on 8 qubit and 19 qubit processors that we've had available as part of our as part of our uh, forest cloud platform and this next series of chips is a generation uh, that's going to get us to enough quantum memory to start to pursue something we call quantum advantage and for by our estimates you need something around you know uh, certainly more than 60 more like 100 or 128 qubits to start to build um, quantum advantage applications. So these are applications where you use the quantum computer to solve business problems uh, faster uh, or cheaper um, than any other computing solution. Right. Okay. So quantum advantage, you're seeing that as uh, sort of like the point where the quantum computing system becomes more powerful than using any other form of computer system to solve a problem. That's right. And it's going to happen in different uh, verticals at different times, and, and it's going to continue to evolve. I mean, for classical computing, we're still discovering new ways to apply them. Um, but the platform we're building on top of our 128 qubit chip, uh, in, including the hardware, that, that, that chip, and then also the quantum cloud services software platform on top, really go together to produce a platform to start to find quantum advantage for the first time. And after 18 months of feedback from researchers from 30 countries and 90 million different experiments, Rigetti has recently revamped their cloud platform. Um, so the way it works is, uh, it used to work, is you downloaded a, uh, some Python libraries and you got an API key and you could write some code in, in our language and it would compile to an instruction set that you'd send over an API to the quantum computer and, you, and you'd get back an answer. The system is now called Rigetti Quantum Cloud Services, and it's driven by an integrated quantum classical model. 
Now, before you ask, that means where regular computers work alongside quantum ones. So we, we've actually taken a step of now, instead of just you know, having a quantum computer giving you an API, we're actually building an integrated quantum classical data center uh, here in California that houses our quantum computers and classical compute resources in-house. Okay, so you really you, you really see at least the immediate future of quantum computing being it being in this space where it sits alongside a traditional system and the quantum computing system takes over when there's benefit in the quantum system and the traditional system uh, does what it's best placed to, at doing. That's right. Yeah, and I don't think that's just in the near term. I think that for for, for a very very long time, that's really how it's it's going to work. And, and I want to really emphasize that the, the coupling between the quantum and classical has to be extremely tight to get the best out of both resources. You know, we're, we're shaving off, you know, milliseconds <laughs> here. Um, and also the programming model has to be tight um, to, to make the best, the best out of the, uh, the technology on the quantum side that's going to be available in the next uh, five, 10 years. Now, looking at traditional computing systems and traditional processing chips, there was always this concept of Moore's Law, which says that computing power would double every couple of years. But does that theory actually hold true when it comes to quantum computing? We're working on it. Uh, it we're, there's not a ton of data yet. <laughs> but, you know, so far, we've uh, we made our first qubit in early 2016, and we've about doubled the number of uh, qubits on our chips. Um, every six months since then, uh, keeping with the roadmap that we have, that 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 trend will will broadly stay. Um, but again, it's it, it still remains to be seen exactly what the cadence will be. You know, is it going to be eighteen months? Is it going to be two years? Are we going to do TikToks between increasing qubit quality and number? As we mentioned earlier in the show, scaling quantum computing allows you to solve big complex problems much faster. And one of the big fears is that quantum computers won't just be used for good, they could also be used to decrypt information that had previously been impervious to hackers. There are a couple of quantum computing algorithms that will possibly break today's encryption methods in terms of uh, how we use, uh, how we secure our computers today. However, these the level of quantum computing power assumes that uh, to run these algorithms assumes a device that needs thousands or even millions of fault tolerant quant uh, qubits, and these are something which the industry is still working towards and is many many years away. There, there are two points in the debate that this is not potentially a problem. One is uh, that there are many encryption. Uh, algorithms that do not rely on prime number factorization. So the first solution is just take something that doesn't encrypt uh, using prime numbers. And um, the second um, thing is that uh, before we're going to solve uh, large enough problems, um, b before we have a, a quantum computer large enough to solve that problem, to actually you know, threat the, the, the um, cryptography community, we need a very, very large number of qubits. And it, I feel it's very far. Despite the very remote possibility of breaking encryption, the community is already talking about ways to protect data in a quantum computing world. Within the last year, uh, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the United States, which maintains the uh, cryptography and encryption standards, you know, put out a call asking for quantum secure encryption methods um, to look to see how they can update encryption standards to be resilient to quantum computers, even though uh, relevant size quantum computers for that application are, are still decades out. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, over, over the long term, it's, it's going to change uh, how we think about encryption, but that's going to, I think that change is going to pale in the way quantum computing, quantum cloud services are going to change how we think about optimization, machine learning, you know, design of, of drugs and molecules and stuff like that. Like, I think there's, that's going to be really where, um, where the impact is first. As we've heard, quantum computing can solve these really big burning problems that scientists and researchers have held for decades. And for Anna and the team at IBM, the goal is really to focus on building the infrastructure needed to help solve those big questions and provide the world with much needed answers. As a technology company, we want to build technology that helps uh, helps the world and you know 
currently we can see the limitations of our current technology, so we're trying to build technology that in the future will be able to solve problems we can't do today. I would really like to see us try to um, sort of lead to revolutionary breakthroughs in, in materials and drug discovery. Um, I know that like this is it might not happen and this could be a long way off, but I think in terms of personalized medicine and and helping uh, people's people's lifestyles in the future, it'd be really good to see if we can instead of turning it into uh, trying to f- drug discovery, really trying to go into drug design. What excites you most about the possibilities of quantum computing? The possibility of quantum computing is being able to solve problems that today we think are unsolvable. We make so many assumptions when we simulate systems that we just assume that we can't do it from scratch. Uh, and I, you know, the hope is that quantum computers in the future will be able to do this so we can understand these, these quantum mechanical systems from the bottom up rather than making assumptions top down. And then Hopefully, the computers that we use to solve these types of problems will be able to be used for to solve other problems that we think can't be solved today. Sort of like how classical computers were first built to, you know, calculate missile trajectories and break uh, in- interesting codes for wartime, but now we use them from for everything. If quantum computers do reach this point of quantum advantage, where they become better at solving problems than traditional computing systems, it will certainly change the way that researchers look at complex problems. But there is still one big issue when it comes to all of this technology, and it's the fact that it's just super confusing. We've been looking at this for weeks, and to be honest, we're still fairly confused about some of the details, because each expert says a slightly different thing due to the different approaches. A lot of the videos that you see online with people trying to explain the technology dive into topics around superposition and quantum entanglement. But your average person won't find it easier to understand quantum computing if you start using too much of this language that they really don't understand. So we've chosen not to dive too far into those ideas, and I don't think we'd actually do you a service by trying to explain them. Now, this lack of understanding could easily flow into the ranks of government. But to be honest, how often do government really understand technical issues? But to its credit, it's worth pointing out that the US House of Representatives recently passed a bill called the National Quantum Initiative Act, which is about trying to make sure the US remains a leader in quantum technology. It's a great first move, and it would be exciting to see other countries really embrace developments in this field at a political level. In Australia, where I'm from, our Australian of the Year, which is among the highest honours one can achieve, is Professor Michelle Simmons who has been working to make quantum chips from silicon. It's exciting technology, and we tried to get Michelle on the show, but being the Australian of the Year is a pretty time-consuming job. But even through all this confusion about the technology, the idea of being able to one day solve significant problems in chemistry and being able to design drugs specifically to each individual person's needs is just really exciting. And I hope that we see a lot more advancements in this technology. For everybody's sake. This episode of Moonshot was hosted by me, Christopher Lawson, and also Andrew Moon. Research and scripting by Mahali Akata. Our cover artwork is by Andrew Millist, and our theme music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And before you go, we know that many of you really love the show and want to see it continue. So please help us out by sharing the show with at least one person. And also, go ahead and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us build our audience and keep the show sustainable. Thanks for your time. Join us again next week for another episode of Moonshot. Moonshot.